What if you could take a material that's mostly empty space, like this three-dimensional structure that's shaped like a cube that I've drawn for you here, but one gram of it actually has more surface area than an entire football field? That's actually not science fiction. In fact, those are called metal organic frameworks, or MOFs, M-O-Fs for short. And these structures are redefining the way that we think about materials, from gas storage to clean energy and even drug delivery. And that's why they're so frequently brought up when we think about the Nobel Prize in chemistry. You see, a metal organic framework is like molecular architecture. And just like in architecture, we can have joints, and we can have linkers. And we can think of metals or clusters of metals as being the linker. So these green dots are meant to indicate different types of metals like magnesium or zirconium. And we can connect these using organic linkers. And very often these end up being carboxylates or dicarboxylates. So consider a dicarboxylic acid on some sort of organic molecule. This would serve as a very potent linker for different types of metal ions. And when you put them together, you end up generating a three-dimensional network that's rigid, crystalline, and also has these large pores. And these pores give moths an incredibly large internal surface area. In fact, up to 7,000 square meters per gram. The concept of porous materials isn't new. We've used zeolites, which are naturally occurring aluminosilicate frameworks for decades in catalysis and gas separation. But zeolites are made from mostly silicon and oxygen, and this makes them not easily tunable. Then in the 1990s, Omar Yagi and co-workers introduced something truly revolutionary. The thought was what if you could design your own framework from scratch, choosing both the metal and the linker, kind of like molecular Legos. That's the birth of what's known as reticular chemistry reticular, the idea that you can build predictable crystalline structures by using these molecular Legos. Yagi's lab developed early moths like Moth 5, which are composed of zinc-4 clusters connected by terephthalate linkers, a structure so elegant it became the textbook example of a moth. Let's take a look at how this works on a molecular level. Let's consider zinc-2 plus ions as our metal center. Let's say that you introduce a bidentate ligand like a 1,4 dicarboxylate organic molecule where you have a negatively charged oxygen, which is why it is a carboxylate that contains three lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. And this is at the one position. And at the four position, we have the exact same functional group where we have that carboxylate, again with an oxygen that has three lone pairs of electrons and is negatively charged. These functional groups can act as ligands where they coordinate to the metal center. So the coordination occurs where the electrons are coming from the oxygen and coordinating to this zinc. Now on the other side of the molecule, where we have this other carboxylate functional group, it can also coordinate to another zinc ion. And that will give us two of our metal ions connected through this linker. Now if we have another one of these dicarboxylate species, on the other side of the molecule, then we can introduce even more three-dimensional structure. So by introducing more of these ligands, we can introduce more binding sites for other metal centers, where we can have another binding at this position, and we can also have another binding at this position. And hopefully you'll notice that this is starting to produce this three-dimensional structure, because this repeating pattern is giving rise to a coordination network. And when this repeats in three dimensions, we end up getting a solid crystalline structure known as a moth. And what's more is that you end up generating these nano-sized cavities where different types of material can insert themselves into the pores. The true beauty, though, is that this framework is modular. So in this example, I use zinc ions, but I could have also used other metal types. For example, magnesium 2 plus could be used, and that would give rise to different electronic properties, and also the size of these ions are different, which is gonna change the size of our moth. And for an organic chemist, we know that we can definitely modify benzene rings, so you can imagine other examples where there are other types of functional groups located on this linker that would give rise to different types of properties as well, which means that modularly we can tune the properties of these moths because by swapping out either the metal or the linker, we're changing the flexibility, the size, and also the different interactions with other incoming molecules. You can think of moths as the ultimate customizable material. You change the metal, 
You change the electronic properties. You change the linker. You alter the pore size and functionality. By changing the functional groups, we can change the linker's attraction to different types of molecules, like polar groups for CO2 capture, or hydrophobic ones for fuel storage. In essence, MOFs allow chemists to design matter with atomic precision. In fact, that's why they're often dubbed designer materials. In other words, we're not just discovering materials anymore, we're designing them. Let's talk about what makes MOFs so exciting outside of the lab. Researchers are finding new ways to use MOFs every day, but some of the most important applications include for things like storage. MOFs can selectively absorb different gases like CO2, methane, or even hydrogen gas. And that's because even a teaspoon of MOFs can absorb liters of gases inside of its pores. A second practical application is actually in the field of catalysis. Remember, MOFs have metals as part of their structure, and those metal centers can actually act as catalytic centers where we can perform different types of reactions. In fact, some MOFs even mimic enzyme-like microenvironments. A third practical application is actually in the field of drug delivery. You see, MOFs can encapsulate different types of materials, and this gives them the ability to later release them slowly. In other words, MOFs can act as selective sponges where you can carry drugs from one position to the target position. For example, if you had the ability to deliver selectively a cancer drug to wherever a tumor is growing and then release it, this would help with some of the off-target effects like chemotherapeutics have. And another exciting use case is actually in the field of sensors and electronics. And that's because MOFs can actually be conductive as well, and therefore they're emerging as identifying gases, pollutants, and even biomolecules. And that's four entirely different industries for just a single class of material. One of the major challenges in early MOFs was stability. Many fell apart in water or under heat, but newer generations, like zirconium-based UIO-66 frameworks, introduce strong metal oxygen bonds that make them extremely robust. These can survive boiling water, high pressure, even acids. And once stability was solved, MOFs moved from curiosities to real-world materials, ready for industry, not just scientific journals. So why might MOFs win the Nobel Prize soon? Because they embody something that the Nobel Committee loves, a conceptual leap that actually changes the way that we design molecules. Omar Yagi's reticular chemistry transforms solid-state materials into a design discipline. You see, it bridges coordination chemistry, material science, and even nanotechnology. As you might know, the Nobel Prize can only be awarded to up to three people, and this makes deciding who might share the prize with Omar Yagi quite challenging. Some of the contenders might include names like Omar Farha, who actually got his PhD working with Omar Yagi. Another contender might be Michael O'Keefe, whose structural net theory contributed to reticular chemistry, or even Makoto Fujita, who's often considered to have worked in parallel with Omar Yagi's group to contribute to some of the foundational aspects of understanding MOFs. And just so nobody feels left out, I also think that Merchadinka's contributions, Will Dictel's contributions, Jeff Long's contributions, contributions, Hong Kei Zhu's contributions, and even Russell Morris might be worthy to share this Nobel Prize with Omar Yagi. MOFs are now used in clean energy research, gas purification, catalysis, and electronics, even water harvesting from desert air. They're a triumph in imagination and precision, a whole new way to do chemistry. So next time someone says it's on the inside that counts, for MOFs, that's literally true. These materials are hollow on purpose, and that emptiness might be the key to solving some of the world's greatest challenges. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up down below, and I'd love to hear what are your thoughts on what you think should win the Chemistry Nobel Prize. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel for more chemistry content, and I'll see you next time.